Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. Hi everybody, this is Janice, and in this episode of our holiday season, we are looking at one of those pieces of our plate that's always brightly colored. It makes you think of all those great, savory and sweet foods for me. We're talking sweet potatoes, and there is nowhere better to talk sweet potatoes than with somebody in Louisiana. So we're gonna talk with Todd O'Neill, and Todd is with Black Gold Farms, and they actually farm in a few states around the U.S., but Todd is really integral in the sweet potato part of the business. Todd, how's it going down there this year? It's going good, no complaints. Harvest is underway and the crop is looking good, so uh, really don't have any complaints right now. So we're talking early October. This will be broadcast a little bit later, but I'm thinking October harvest seems to set us up perfectly for the holidays, right? Like you'll have a lot of that going out in the, the next couple of weeks. That is that is correct. That is that is correct. To back up just a little bit, we actually have potatoes at our farm 12 months a year now. It's not just a, a holiday food anymore for us. I mean, we ship potatoes 12 months out of the year and we've got storage capacity with refrigeration and humidity to make sure that we maintain quality sweet potatoes throughout the whole year. And what they are is, is when those potatoes are harvested, like we've got some that we harvested mid-August, we brought them into our storage facility and we put them through what's called the curing process. Okay. In sweet potatoes, unlike, I'm going to call them Irish potatoes or white potatoes, you, when you bring those potatoes into a house, you cool them down. With sweet potatoes, you actually heat them up. You bring them up to about 85 degrees and then try to maintain about 85 to 90% humidity. Wow. What that does is, is it starts the healing process. If the skin has got any wounds on it or something like that, and it starts the curing process, which is breaking down the sugars in the sweet potato, which gives it its sweetness of what they call a cured sweet potato. We've had some potatoes in there going on about six weeks at that time whenever they've been in there six weeks and then the longer they stay in the storage that of course they continue to get a little sweeter along so what we've got now is is we've got new crop cured potatoes and we are actually ready and geared up for our biggest time of the year which is thanksgiving which we'll ship a third of our crop out wow at that time packing potatoes and sending trucks out and all of that so that's that it's our busiest time of the year Busiest time of the year, but people like me do like sweet potatoes throughout the year. You know, mm -hmm. for me, I like them like a baked potato along with a steak or something some oh. of the time. I don't keep that just to Thanksgiving or Christmas. <laughs> well, and that's and that's what's happened over the last several years is, is at one time, sweet potatoes in this area, everybody grew sweet potatoes. Every 40-acre farmer had a patch of sweet potatoes. Well, and then I'm going to say as people moved off the farm and into the large cities, they had always associated sweet potatoes with, I'm going to call it being poor. So people kind of kicked the sweet potato to the side. Well, over the past, I'm going to say 10 years, you've actually seen an increase in potato consumption over the last 10 years, and it's been on the incline. Reason being is due to the health kick and the healthiness of a sweet potato. I'm not sure if it's number one or number two as far as beta carotene. So, I mean, it's orange. It's got the, the orange flesh sweet potatoes, you know, all your vitamin A, high in the beta carotene. And so now sweet potatoes are not just about Thanksgiving anymore. It's, it's more of a health conscious deal. It's good for people that may have diabetes. They can eat that instead of a Irish potato, which, you know, is high in starch. Uh, so, you know, it's really changed over the past several years with the consumption of sweet potatoes from, a, like I say, just the, the Thanksgiving tradition. Christmas is pretty good and then and then Easter is pretty good. But overall, we ship potatoes year round. And this year has been a little different with the COVID and all of that stuff that's going on. We've actually seen a little bit of an uptick in our sales. We sell some potatoes to a processor, which goes to Bogum Sweet Potato Fries, and then we also <laughs> ship to some big retailers. Well, everybody being at home now, or was at home throughout the year, they were shopping more. They were eating at home more. Wow. So we actually saw an uptick in sales this year, just simply for the fact that people were cooking at home. It's been a, I don't really don't know what word to use. I mean, it's been a challenging year, but it's been a good year for the sale of sweet potatoes. Yeah. You mentioned selling them to a processor. 
Do the same sweet potatoes get used for fresh market and for me in the produce section as get used for a processor and use it for the frozen foods? Actually, we've, we've got a, two different varieties that we grow. One is a Bayou Bell, which we use exclusively for a processor. From a catch the eye kind of deal, it's not really the prettiest potato, but it works good for the processors. And what they're actually doing is making sweet potato fries out of it. And it was developed for that that variety was developed to be processed to for sweet potato fries what we grow for our fresh market standpoint is orleans and then we also ship some of those to the processor as well orleans is our we call it our fresh market sweet potato you say that it was developed i'm going to guess that was from louisiana state is there a breeder there it is it was at the research station at chase it was a variety that they had come up with and the processors really liked it. And that's where it's took off from there. And those sound like such Louisiana products <laughs> with the name Orleans and Idiot. Blue Bayou. <laughs> I'm guessing that, uh, Bayou Bell. Bayou and, then, Bell. and then there's there, there's an older variety that a lot of people still grow called the Beauregard. <laughs> of so. course. There are other places in the U.S. that grow sweet potatoes though, right? I think North Carolina, probably in the Southeast. North Carolina is the largest grower of sweet potatoes. Mississippi is number two, California is number three, and Louisiana is number four. Well, I always thought think of Louisiana first because when I worked at Delta Vine, somebody would come up from the Louisiana part of the Delta and bring us sweet potatoes every fall. Like mm-hmm. they would bring them from their operation. And so the, the, the connection between Louisiana and my sweet potatoes has always been there, whether y'all are the number one state or not. Louisiana used to be the largest grower, but over the course of the years, North Carolina has really grown. And from a quality standpoint, and I'm not saying this because I'm from Louisiana, but from a quality standpoint, Louisiana potatoes look better to the eye than the North Carolina does. North Carolina soil type is a sandier soil. Louisiana's is, it's a silt loam. The, a lot of the Louisiana potatoes are grown in North Louisiana are grown on what's called the Mason Ridge and it stretches just about where you, where the Arkansas line is at. It goes up into Arkansas a little bit and then it comes down and it runs out about Wisner. It's a ridge that runs down through there and if you travel east off of the ridge you run down into what's yep. the delta and then the floodplains of the Delta. Yeah, so people looking at one of those nice geographical kind of geological maps can actually see that the Delta is a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that a little bit with a a gentleman named Mr. Ray Young in one of our first episodes because he taught me all I needed to know about soils and called silt loam. If it's a really good silt loam, it's it's this ice cream ground because you knew you could really produce some good food and some good crops out of that. That's good. (laughs) <laughs> so can you tell me, um, you mentioned the curing process from potatoes to sweet potatoes is different. With white potatoes, you want to use a cold curing system and sweet potatoes, they love it hot and humid, which it now helps me understand why I like sweet potatoes so much. Because even though I live in the Midwest right now, I prefer the heat and the humidity over cold winters. Mm-hmm. Are, what are the other differences between those kind of, I, I mean, is it so, a tuber versus a root or? That's that's it. So so the thing is, is a sweet potato. And when we do that curing process, we start the curing process, which is typically four to five days. It varies a little bit depending on the time of the year that the potato comes in, whether it's in August versus potatoes that come in that are harvested in September versus potatoes that are harvested in October. But typically, you know, it, it allowed to be a little bit quicker process doing the heat. And then after that process of four to five days, then we turn the refrigeration on and we try to maintain 85% humidity and then bring the temperatures down to 55, 56 degrees. Basically, we're putting those potatoes to sleep. And at that time, during the curing process, that potato is respiring. He's breathing just like you and I are. So the deal is, is if the CO2 levels build up in the building, you can actually rot those potatoes. So we've got sensors in place and whenever the, the CO2 levels start getting up at a just say X parts per million, the outside doors, louvers open up and we bring fresh air in yep. and we uh, vent, the, vent those storages. Do you have uh, vented floors that they sit on or? No, we don't, we don't have vented floors. We just have some, we have 
one building that's got T-doors at the top, and then the other two buildings have got louvers that okay. actually open up. And they, the buildings also sense if, just say you were, we're trying to bring the temperature down, and it senses outside that, you know, the outside temperature is cooler than the inside, so the refrigeration will actually cut off, and it will bring the outside air, and it's kind of a energy-efficient way to help cool those potatoes down. But uh, back to your question about a sweet potato versus a Irish potato. Of course, Irish potato is a tuber. Sweet potato is a root, uh, and that's the that's the biggest difference. Is and um, and I mean, you know, other than the um, other than the word potato, they have uh, they're <laughs> they're they're nothing alike. Sweet potato is actually part of the morning glory family so it's actually a weed is what it is oh man so <laughs> yeah well that certainly gives a different impression right so do the flowers on it kind of look like morning glory flowers are they pretty they do they actually they 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 do they have a purple flower that certain times of the season they'll put that flower on and they actually crossed a sweet potato with a morning glory to get a sweet potato to bloom Really? So, science back years ago, Science yes. is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. It sure is. Tell me, how do you guys plant potatoes and harvest them at so many different times? Like, how, how hard is that schedule on you guys? So we get what we call G-Zero plants. They're actually from a lab down in Baton Rouge, and we actually bring those plants in to, to what we call our early generation seed. The one thing about sweet potatoes is they are not GMO. They're not genetically modified. There's no what you see like with other crops and everything. So it's 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 all natural. If there's a mutation in it, it's a natural mutation. There's nothing that is science-based that has altered that sweet potato. We get those plants in typically the first week of December, and we start our greenhouse, which is seed that we are going to collect for the following year. It does not go into what we call our commercial production that's going to be packed out for fresh market or go to the processor. It's actually all grown for seed. So the stuff that we get in December of 2019 and we planted in the field of 2020 is not going to be used for seed until the year 2021. So when we go to harvest that, we're going to be collecting all of that. But So we're growing that crop. That crop gets along, and then we take cuttings off of it. Sweet potato is a—it's a strange animal. It takes the, <laughs> those plants, and as they grow, you take and cut the end of it off, and you plant it in right beside, in the soil right beside it, in the potting soil in the greenhouse, huh. and it starts growing and coming out. And then, and then the other one are putting their buds are putting back on, so they're growing. So you basically are just making replication cuts in the greenhouse. Okay. You do that, and then you take those to the field. And then you take cuttings from the field to try to replicate and grow the amount of acres to get the plants that you need to try to plant the amount of acres of seed that you want for that year. So that's how our, our seed program works. Uh, it's kind of a, that's a quick, fast way to do it. And then we'll harvest those potatoes. We've already harvested some of our seed. And then some of the later planted stuff we'll harvest sometime the end of this month. But from a commercial standpoint, we actually take the potato itself, the potato just like what you grow in the grocery store, except a smaller size. And we collect that from the previous year. And then in last of February, first of March, whenever the soil temperatures get up, we get some consistent soil temperatures, you know, above 60. We'll go out and we'll lay those potatoes on the ground. It's called the bedding process. And lay those potatoes on the ground, put some dirt on top of them, and then cover them with plastic, which what we're doing is we're making a miniature greenhouse huh. in the field. And we and it starts heating up, and then depending on the weather, sunshine and all that, four to six weeks, we will pull that plastic off of those beds because the, the slips, is what we call them, will have emerged out. And you'll take that plastic off, water them, try to get them to grow, and those things will grow up. And whenever they get about on the bed, whenever they get about anywhere from 12 to 14 inches tall, we'll actually take and cut those down at the ground, and then we'll have a machine that's called a transplanter. We've got several eight-row transplanters, and there's two people per row. And we'll take those transplanters, and then we'll go and we'll plant those in the field. And that's, we're planting our commercial crop, whether it be for fresh or process at that time. If you don't mind, I'll just ex- I'll try and explain for people who haven't seen it okay. before. So what you're talking about is your, your, your team will come through, and they'll cut the small, you know, one-foot 
kind of pieces. And then do your folks actually ride on the back? Like there's a tractor that pulls a vehicle that they're on and then they hand feed those into part of the tractor or are they actually trying to get them into the soil? They're, they actually are feeding them into what we call it a finger. It's a transplanter. Okay. They use the same thing to, to plant tobacco. They use this, like any transplant type crops is what they'll use. Yeah. And um, that's what uh, we bring over some H-2A workers. It's a government regulated system to where we apply for workers to come over from Mexico and we bring over 250 H-2A workers to work in the fields. We also hire any local people that come up at that time to work in the fields as well. And during planting time, they'll cut the slips, and then we'll transplant them. And at the time that we get through transplanting, our H-2A workers will go back home to Mexico. We'll tend to the crop. We'll put some fertilizer out. We'll put some crop protectants out and monitor the crop throughout the year and do some irrigation if, if needed, some supplemental if we don't get any rain. And typically, you can start harvesting that crop depending on the spacing that you plant the plants, but anywhere from around 100 to 120 days old, we'll start harvesting the crop, trying to maximize yield. I think we've talked a little bit about H-2A workers on a segment we did on peppers because that specialized crew really is helpful. And so they're probably with you, what, a month, two months, something like that to get planting all done? Probably about for plant for planting around 45 to 50 days. Okay. And then at harvest time, they're here for about uh, 75 days. Yeah. We've got them here the, uh, in August. and. Uh, They'll run through from mid-August uh, till just about to the end of October. So with harvest time, we have uh, a couple of ways that we harvest potatoes. Potatoes that are going directly to the processor, we actually dig with a, we call it a, a bulk harvester. It's the same kind of harvester that they use to harvest Irish potatoes. And those, those are harvested with the machine. They go into a truck and then we bring them to, we call it a dirt eliminator table. Those trucks are backed up mm -hmm. to the dirt eliminator table, unloaded and run across the machine to, to remove any farm material or excess dirt or anything like that. And from there, the processor sends their trucks out and picks those potatoes up and takes them onto the plant to be processed into fries. And that's what we call our direct to plant. Yeah. Uh, that's the Bayou Bell variety that I talked about earlier. And then the other way we harvest is with our conventional four-row harvesters. It takes about 25 people per machine. That includes a tractor driver to harvest those. And then we have some trailers coming alongside the four-row harvesters. And what we're doing is we're doing some field grading. We're splitting those potatoes three ways if we're collecting seed. If we're not collecting seed, then we're only splitting two ways. We're splitting the jumbos off which go to the processor to make fries. So that's the, the Orleans that go to the processor to make fries. Mm -hmm. And then the, the smaller size profile, the number one profile, we actually bring to the shed for storage. And if we're collecting seed, then we'll be collecting seed at that time off of the, off of the fields as we harvest. That, that sounds pretty complicated for a harvesting process. <laughs> Oh, it's, to have uh, 25 uh, people out with one or two, <laughs> one, one crew. Well, we've got, we've actually got almost 300 workers here now. Wow. Wow. That's, that's incredible. I, I'm still trying to picture harvest. I hope black gold, I'm going to have to check and see if you guys have some video or something of that. Cause I know I saw some video part of your operation. We might have, I don't yeah, know. But some of us love to watch videos on that. What makes yams and sweet potatoes different? Are they the same thing? So... I don't know if this was in the 50s or 60s. Louisiana tried to separate itself from everyone else. So that was a marketing ploy at that time whenever they started using the word yams. And, and you can still see some of the sweet potato boxes of some of the, the guys that around that still pack says Louisiana yams. And it is not a yam. It's a, it's a sweet potato. But it was a marketing idea that come, like I say, I think it was in the 50s or 60s that they, that they came out with yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but no, a yam, you know, it's, uh, I believe it's from Central or South America, and it's a white starchy root. <laughs> it's, it definitely seems different, but you still see the word pop up now and then. That was the genius of some marketing folks in Louisiana, huh? 
trying to stand out a little different. That is right. That's right. All right. Well, yes. uh, there's plenty of other marketing programs in the world of, of fresh fruits and vegetables, so I, I totally understand it. That's right. Over the last few years, we talked a minute about how the market has grown. One thing I've noticed is sweet potato fries are a lot more common, even in restaurants, seeing more sweet potato tater tots. Mm-hmm. What else have you seen change in the world of sweet potatoes over your career? Well, you said it a lot there where you see sweet potato fries and then sometimes you'll see some of the QSRs, quick serve restaurants, do LTOs, limited time offers of sweet potatoes. I I know that I've seen that happen with Chick-fil-A. They did a sweet potato waffle cut. I've seen it happen with Arby's. Do I believe it was Arby's. They did a uh, a limited time offer of uh, sweet potato fries. I've I think maybe some of the smaller QSRs, I think Smash Burger actually has uh, sweet potato fries. Uh, the Culver's, I've seen them offer sweet potato fries. Yeah. You know, and then not only that, but, you know, then there's a retail version of sweet potato fries as well that, you know, you can just grab at the at the local grocery store and, and take home and throw in the oven and bake them up for and ha- that way you can have them at home for home use yeah have you guys done some of the things with like poly wrap in order to to put them in the microwave yes we we actually do micros uh we do pound and a half steamables we do three pound bags five pound bags and then we actually do a tray pack that has four potatoes on it along with the uh, the fresh bulk it, which is just loose. And I mean, that was another thing that happened back earlier in the year where it really didn't set in with me until I was on the sales call. This was back in March. They was talking about, you know, we seen an uptick in demand for sweet potatoes. Well, on a sales call, I seen a grocery store. And I mean, it was like the whole fruit and vegetable thing was wiped out, except right there on the end cap, there was uh, uh, some loose apples left. And at that point, I was like, man, this is, uh, this is, this is for real. But the thing that we saw was instead of loose potatoes, people wanted stuff bagged, (laughs) uh, which we was already bagging some, but then we seen a a real increase in bagged material. And I'm going to say that, uh, people in their mind was thinking, well, I don't want to be grabbing loose potatoes that somebody else has been touching or picking up. I want to be able to just grab a bag and grab some some potatoes that nobody else has touched. I just grab the bag and go. So we did see that. You know, that, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I could see that happening early in March and April when people were first at home. Mm-hmm. Not sure how the virus spread and things. And I know that the onion farmer we talked to a couple of weeks ago said, you know, sales in grocery stores went crazy on onions too Mm -hmm. but he also had so much going into restaurants that it it didn't kind of offset the business for him you guys have uh, both the the retail and the restaurant service kind of angles and Mm -hmm. were they pretty pretty equal up until you know this boom or no no oh uh yes it was it was it was fairly equal but then we actually did see a decrease in need for processing potatoes yeah. at that time because, uh, you know, the restaurants were closed, people were at home, but we seen the uptick in the retail side. And the thing is, is we still have not seen much of a decrease in the retail side. Now, the processing side has since come back around. I don't think it's as strong as it was before, but it has come back around. But the the retail side of things for us has really started growing in March. And I mean, it's really maintained throughout the summer, which typically is a slow period for us, July and August. That just really is people. The thing is, is, the other thing is, is people a lot of times associate cooler weather with sweet potatoes and not the hot summertime. We did continue to see a lot of movement in July and August, which was strange. Yep. I can't help but think all those air fryers that have been being sold also help out, right? That's right. Folks are used to getting some sweet potatoes when they're at the restaurants or something, and now they have this air fryer at home, and they want to try something new and different at home. I'll tell you what, those air fryers really do. They work good. (laughs) They do. I'm, I'm a fan already, too. So tell me, what are some of your favorite ways to eat sweet potatoes? Oh, I just take it, take just like a regular potato and peel it, and, uh... 
get a cast iron skillet and put a little butter in it and get it hot and then try to slice that sweet potato lengthways kind of long and then just brown it on both sides and eat it just like that with a little salt on it. Uh, I brown like it, it in some butter. That's right. Just take a take you as, uh, half a stick of butter and put on the cast. It's got to be cast iron though. A good seasoned cast iron skillet. Well seasoned. Melt that butter on there and then let that potato sit on there and brown it and then put a little salt on it and it's it's really good. I like them baked. I like a pie. You know, the traditional uh, sweet potato casserole that's at Thanksgiving, I'm not that big of a fan of it. I just, on a baked sweet potato, I just put butter in it. I don't, if it's if it's a good sweet potato, you don't need to put any cinnamon on it and sugar and all that stuff. It's good just like it is with just some butter in it. So that's me. You're not a f- fan of those casseroles at, at the holidays. It sounds like you just said that. So you could get out of the, the really tense question of whether you think marshmallows belong on them. Uh, that's right. Or, or not. Or, or, or pecans. pecans. That's right. <laughs> You know, that's where the controversy really comes in mm-hmm. with sweet potatoes. Uh, I've had them in a biscuit. I've had sweet potato biscuits. I've had sweet potato ice cream, uh, sweet potato candy, sweet potato cake, a bunch of different ways. How did you get so deep in sweet potatoes? Well, I, uh, whenever I was a kid growing up, my folks actually raised sweet potatoes. It was, uh, I remember, I didn't get to ride the transplanter. I had to walk behind it. I remember being in the field helping dig potatoes and then one of the worst whoopings I got was out in the potato field with some potato vines so but needless to say I didn't mess up after that <laughs> well if folks are, are looking to buy some sweet potatoes can they get them with the black gold name on them or you said you package them in bags well we do we do sell to some retailers most of them have their private label but there is a few black gold bags floating around out there. And then if anybody's passing through Dell High, we actually sell 40-pound <laughs> boxes out the front door to folks that just pull up. So, And you'll be surprised since the, when we had the cool snap here about uh, two weeks ago, the sales really increased. And I mean, to the point to where we've just set a pallet of sweet potatoes out front and we put it up every night. But we'll box up a, a pallet of sweet potatoes, 50, you know, 50 boxes on the pallet and Within two days, they're gone, and you put another one out there. So, I mean, it's that it's the time of year where people associate the cold weather and, and the crops being harvested, and they're coming by the farm just to, you know, get the potatoes here, and they, they know where the sweet potatoes come from. Yeah, so yeah, that's great. We have a lot of repeat customers. I bet. Can you give us some tips on storing them at home so you guys cool them down and chill them before you, you know, to hold on to them for a while? How do we store them at the house? We do. I mean... <laughs> The ones that I take home, I just put them on the counter, and uh, a lot of times they're there till they like to be there for four or five weeks, and you know they'll be fine. But typically, you know, you just want to have them in a cool, dark place. You know, if your pantry's cool, you can put them on the floor of the pantry and just leave them there. They should be fine. But just be sure it's cool and it's dark. The heat is the enemy of it. It'll cause it to uh, might put some sprouts on. Uh, or slips and start coming up out of there and then it causes it to get uh corky yeah. on the inside but just in a cool dark place can you tell me sometimes sweet potatoes get like stringy like it seems not to come out as smooth or something what happens with that what makes it i believe work? that's more of a of a variety issue we don't see that in the orleans now some of the the older varieties grown that was grown i think it was a puerto rican maybe they said it was a real good tasting sweet potato but it was just stringy on the inside and i have seen some borgars that are a little bit stringy on the inside i can't answer for covington which is basically grown in north carolina but these uh the orleans i haven't seen that in the orleans like like i have in some of those other varieties all right one of the last questions i have for you so many people have the kids at home you know doing virtual school or homeschool or something mm-hmm. this year i can remember having a potato cut up and like growing a potato vine you know can you do that with a sweet potato and if so how would you tell them to to grow it for the year they wanted to try and plant it so well i had some grow in my windowsill but i threw them away the other day i've had some <laughs> potatoes in my windowsill i had i had one there that sat there two years <laughs> wow and uh it had done finally run out of gas. It didn't have anything, no pun intended there. <laughs> but uh, uh, it wasn't putting on any sprouts anymore. They'd come up and I'd break them off. 
So the easiest way to do is, I'm going to say, get a wide mouth jar, like an old... Mason or a ball jar. Miracle wheel, mason mason jar or something like that. You can stick some stick a few toothpicks in the side of it and just kind of set that potato down um, in that jar or put water in it to where there's, there's water touches up to the base of that sweet potato. And keep it in the window sill in a, you know, fairly warm place. I'm going to say it needs to be, you know, 70s probably. Uh, and so it can get some direct sunlight and you give it a few weeks there and as long as that water's up there around there you'll see some white feed roots start to drop out of the bottom of that sweet potato and then you'll see some sprouts start to come out the top you know you can just go to the grocery store and, and do this with one that you pick up from the grocery store you love to have anywhere from four to six slips come out on that sweet potato and uh, if you want to you got you four to six plants to go plant in your garden for uh, for the spring <laughs> I've seen a lot of people plant uh, potatoes in like big buckets you know like paint buckets mm-hmm. or 10 gallon buckets or something I wondered if you could do that with sweet potatoes because then if it got cold on a day you could bring them back inside you probably could I've never done it but you probably could uh, just be sure you drill some holes in the bottom of that bucket so that any excess moisture can get out this it's one thing a sweet potato does not like and that's excess moisture it's a it's a pretty drought tolerant crop once it is planted and it gets established it's uh it's it's pretty hardy but it does not like wet feet (laughs) cotton's the same way they go together really well Mm -hmm. well is there anything i missed asking you todd you know sweet potatoes is i'm gonna say this it's a challenging crop i uh, knew a guy that grew sweet potatoes for 52 years and he said of those 52 years, no one year was the same. There were some that were similar, but none of those years were the same. Black Gold enjoys challenges, and we're a team of farmers. And at that point, you know, we love challenging things, and we do those difficult deals, which is grow sweet potatoes. If it was easy, I'm serious, everybody would be doing it. And it is, it's labor intensive, it's, it's stressful, but at the end of the day, we get to, uh, put some food on somebody's table and then we get to do a podcast and tell them about it boy that sounds like the perfect world no seriously there's a lot of pride in putting food into the food chain and and knowing that your work shows up on somebody's plate and Mm -hmm. i would think i think knowing so many people celebrate the holidays with with you guys as a part of it is a nice boost too oh that's what um and some of the retail chains that we sell to if i'm on vacation or something i'm i pull in the store to go look and see what our product looks like on the table on the shelf and i've got some pictures of it and you know just to the good and the bad you know you want to see what your product looks like and then you know i was down in new orleans walking walking on the streets there and there was a grocery delivery truck and i looked and right in back of the right inside the back door of the deal was was a bag of black gold sweet potatoes. Now these were reds, but not <laughs> black gold sweet potatoes, but it was said black gold farms. And it was a, I think a 50 pound sack of red Irish potatoes. And I snapped a picture of it, you know? So, I mean, the deal is, is no, I didn't grow them, but I'm associated with the company that did. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's a lot of pride with that. And I, I hope your employees all feel the same way. Black gold is a, a bit larger than some family farms are, but I still know the folks, the families that's behind it. So even though you're in a couple of different states and growing Mm -hmm. different kinds of potatoes, uh, it's run like a family and and friends kind of operation. It is. It really is. And I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to grow a crop. We're trying to to feed some people and all trying to do it safe to be sure that all of our employees are taken care of. We want to be sure just not the employees are safe, but, you know, that we've got a safe, reliable food supply. You know, we go through a, a lot of things here from a global gap audit to be sure that everything is taken care of. We, we make sure that, uh, you know, we do the, the right thing with, with soil fertility. We're not putting a lot of times people threw out that word sustainability because it was a buzzword and it still is. But, you know, people talk about sustainability this and sustainability that. And I mean, at the end of the day, farmers are sustainable because they don't want the soil eroding away. They don't want excess weeds in their field they want they they want to protect the land 
because they can't supply the food that's needed if they don't protect the land. So we do our best to make sure that we take care of the land while take care of the people as well. Well, I really appreciate your joining us. We're adding this episode to one on turkey and cranberries and pumpkins. So folks are going to be able to get a really good idea about what goes on with the foods on their plate before it gets to them. So thanks so much, Todd, for being here. All righty. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as Todd and I obviously did. That man loves sweet potatoes. I loved hearing about his family's connections to it, even the joke about uh, getting a whooping. But his recipe on just slicing them open, use a lot of butter, cast iron skillet, I had to try it and I'm going to tell you folks, it was good. I thought it'd probably be similar to a baked potato, but there's something special there, so you're going to have to try it. I want to thank Leah for helping me find Todd. I've known her for a long time. Her family is the family behind Black Gold, and she was so helpful in finding exactly the kind of farmer who loves talking about the food and the farming aspects. Todd was a perfect pick. I actually have video of Todd that was shot this year of him talking about the production season and all. It was done by Twyla, which is This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. That and some other video and a bunch of other links and some photos are all going to be on the website at groundedbythefarm.com. And most of that will be in your show notes. So go ahead and check them out. Um, This is going to be one of our last episodes of the season. Next up is corn. That's the end of the holiday series as well as the end of the first season of Grounded by the Farm. We're going to take a short break for a few weeks, be able to play a few of the best of from this first year. Feel free to weigh in on what you think those are on social media. Email us at Grounded by the Farm. We would be happy to hear from you. There's a contact on our website groundedbythefarm.com and while you're at it tell us what you think we ought to make sure we include in season two i'm looking at a few different options a few different paths that we might go down so would love to hear from some people who would say hey i'd really like to hear this that would be awesome finally i want to say thank you to the guys at editor core who have helped me with a couple of these last few episodes and the show notes on this one. I think uh, we're always improving the show here and Editor Core has been a, a great ad for us. So thanks Mike and the team. I really appreciate the help you guys have given me. Thanks and we will talk to you in two weeks as we talk about corn. Goodbye.